Welcome back. Up next, we have a really, really interesting presentation by Mr. Alpha Dibehi. He's the Dean of Customer Experience Leadership Institute from Majid Al Futaim from United Arab of Emirates. He's going to be speaking on diversity and inclusion and low fi customer experience. Low fidelity customer experience is what he's going to be talking about. Before I hand over the, digi uh, the digital stage over to Mr. Alpha, I would like to give a short introduction about him. Alpha Dibehi is the Dean of the Majid Al Futaim Customer Experience Leadership Institute, where he's responsible for transforming the culture of the organization and the mindset of the 40,000 plus individual employees towards customer obsession. Majid Al Futaim is a multinational in 21 countries with interests in shopping malls and communities, hotels, cinemas, lifestyle, fashion, grocery, cinemas. He has 25 years of experience and worked across a variety of industries and geographies, including Africa. He was previously VP and Forrester responsible for CX Consulting in EMEA. He has held several senior executive roles in boutique consultancies at the cutting edge of CX. He has led major CX projects in B2C and B2B in both private and public sectors. He's a CX thought leader and has published two books on customer experience. He's a noted speaker and former professor. He also was a research neuroscientist in the early stage of his career. His academic background is varied and deep. He has MBA from New York University, master's degrees in statistics, psychology, and public health from the City University of New York. Good morning, Alpha. Welcome to Customer Experience Management Summit. Thank you so much for taking our time to be here with us today. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. So yes, I'm going to speak today about uh, diversity and inclusion in lo-fi, what I call lo-fi customer experience. Um, and I have come across this topic in a number of, uh, of ways. And I thought, let me just start off with a couple of basics. Why, why, why am I even talking about this topic? Um, primarily, I think it's really important for people who are working on customer experience, dealing with uh, the continent um, and where it goes, because I think we're being impacted by it. And also, I think we have an opportunity if we do this correctly. Um, let's start off with a, a little bit of a basics of what do I even mean by diversity and inclusion. I think depending on your background, you've run across this, you probably have had, if you're in a you know, relatively large company, some kind of training on DNI, diversity and inclusion. Um, the, the, the simple way of putting it is if you think about a party, I think some of you have heard of this, you think of diversity as being invited to the party. So that's a good start. You know, if you're not invited, that's not great. Inclusion is being asked to, to dance at that party. And then you might even go a step further and saying equity is, is being able to select some of the music at that party. So really the, the, the area that we're talking about is, is going just beyond being present. It's being a part of the activity, a part of the party. So diversity is a mix and inclusion is making the mix work. So that's kind of where we're starting off with just the general intro to when we say DNI, what are we talking about? Um, when we go to um, the concept of diversity, really we're trying to say, recognize that there is something called bias. You know, all of us have this implicit bias, uh, unconscious bias, we're not necessarily aware of it. Um, and that bias impacts how we do things. Uh, again, in the, in the CX world, you know, if we're creating personas, if we're doing journey mapping, all of those kinds of things, if we're interpreting data, that bias impacts the way we do things. And of course, in diversity and inclusion, it's not about necessarily eliminating that bias. It's about being aware of it and then addressing it through, through uh, some sort of antidote. We also have in the world of uh, behavioral economics, the idea that we all use heuristics. So behavioral e economics, as you may know, is a is sort of a relatively, you know, in a, some sense, in the public's eye, new branch of economics. So traditional economics says we're all rational beings. When you give people a choice, they make a very rational decision. This one has utility, this has benefit, or more benefit than the other. If A has more benefit than B, then the rational person will always choose A. What we've found with behavioral economics is that 
that's not always true. And we kind of know that just through observation in our everyday lives. So behavioral economics doesn't start with the assumption that we are rational beings and then tries to figure out uh, and then comes up with mathematics that explains that and then looks at behavior to see how does that mathematics apply to the behavior. Behavioral economics starts with the idea of let's observe behavior first, figure out what we're doing, and then figure out the math on the back end of that. So it literally starts with the person first, which of course is kind of central to the way we're thinking about CX. And the way I think about behavioral economics in, in current terms is it's a kind of a science of customer experience. And these heuristics, it's just, heuristic is just another term for a mental shortcut that we use to solve problems. And those mental shortcuts create space for us, but they also create problems in the sense that many of those shortcuts that we're using um, are, in a sense, if you look at them on the surface, they look irrational, except that we can explain them because they follow some principles. And again, I'm just introducing this idea that we have implicit biases, clearly wrong-headed things. And then we have these shortcuts, these heuristics that we're all using all the time. And these things can get in the way or out of the way of things that we are, we are working on. Okay, so just to establish that basis. Now, when we start getting into customer experience, and we're building experiences. You know, there's a number of techniques and tools and things, but just to put it in a broad scope, there's this concept of design thinking. And design thinking is this iterative kind of process that we go through where we reframe questions and problems in a sense from the customer's perspective. So we can kind of see it from the customer's perspective and that we can hopefully identify and address the actual problems in the way the customer sees it. If we do that, of course, the solution is more relevant to the customer. If the solution is more relevant to the customer, the customer is more likely to, to engage and do all the things that we we're talking about. So design thinking is this kind of general approach. Uh, you can apply it to a number of things, but it's this process and you can throw in things like jobs to be done, um, you can throw in you know, the traditional journey mapping and those sorts of things into that concept of design thinking or broad, a broad scope thing. One of the basis uh, or basics concepts in uh, design thinking is you must have a diversity of perspective when you are approaching something from a, with the design thinking perspective. So if you're going to try to reframe and look at that problem from the customer's point of view, a key component of that is pretty much you are not that customer. And the best thing is that if you bring a diversity of perspectives, and by perspective, this could be worldviews, this could be you know, things, you know, demographic kind of perspectives, income perspectives, all kinds of things you can throw into it. But if you have this diversity of perspective, you're more likely to balance those biases I talked about you're more likely to at least take into consideration those heuristics, which might be shortcuts, which seem irrational that you might want to overcome as you design these great solutions that we're all looking for. So design thinking is kind of where we're headed. Now, I call this diversity and inclusion in lo-fi CX. Let me just start off by saying, I'll get to what I mean by lo-fi, and let me just say what I mean by hi-fi CX. Hi-fi would just be tech, you know, the heavy tech enabled CX. The world is becoming, obviously, we're going more mobile, the internet, social media, all these very high tech things. And of course now AI and machine learning is out there. And I think this is particularly important to Africa because one of the things that AI and machine learning will do or is doing is making you know, quote unquote customer service and some aspects of customer experience relatively cheap to do for millions uh, over, over time. So you're cutting down on some human resources. So I, I am not specifically spending a lot of time on Hi-Fi CX, but I did want to address this because it's important. When you often talk about diversity and inclusion in Hi-Fi CX, that is we have some AI, some machine learning, and we're going to have something that goes out there and people will interact with it and the, the machine, the AI will interact with them 
and, and we, as we get into some more no, normal kinds of applications, one of the things that's happening that we have seen uh, is that when there is a lack of diversity of perspective in the buildup, you know, the creation of the AI models and algorithms, when we put that into machine learning, which means the machine teaches itself and it perpetuates itself and it gets better over time. When we set it up, oftentimes without that diversity and perspective up front, what happens is the implicit biases of the people who set it up tends to get perpetuated in the AI itself. So the AI doesn't correct the, the biases if people set it up with those implicit, again, unconscious biases, not intentional. If they set it up with those things in place, what happens in AI typically is it gets exaggerated and that sort of thing. So we know this already from AI. So we know, I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not spending too much time on this, but we already know from various examples that certain names, you know, you can imagine this uh, if you're in, in Europe and in the West, um, certain names will be associated with more positive kinds of sentiments and other names, maybe more traditional African names uh, or African-American names might be associated with more negative sentiment as an example or uh, things like uh, if you have a training set and you kind of recognize faces to to provide various things if the people who put it together were really comfortable with the training set and what happened to be in that training set were all white faces then when you get to the and when you put it into the machine learning mode and the machine is teaching itself and they're running across more and more black faces, what happens is oftentimes they, the machine misinterprets those black faces because it didn't learn on those faces. So again, I think my whole point, and I think you get it by now, is that you need to have this diversity up front in order for this AI and machine learning to occur. So if I were talking about high fi CX, I would spend a lot more time on what to do in those situations and what to look out for and how that's impacting us and how that will impact us moving forward. That's another presentation, but it's the similar vein of where I'm going to. That takes us to lo-fi. So what do I mean by lo-fi CX? Obviously, if I'm talking about tech-enabled AI CX as hi-fi, lo-fi is the normal, you walk into a shop, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with you know face-to-face, -face, something along those lines, possibly hybrid, but there's a human touch there. And for many parts, of uh, in Africa, we're dealing you know, obviously in everywhere in the world, there's a lo fi component. Oftentimes, we're putting a lot of emphasis these days on hi fi, but that still does not mean lo fi is important. It is important, it will always be important for certain things. So, you can imagine, even though we have mobile banking and other kinds of things, the lo fi experience is very, very important. Okay, so now hopefully, I've set up why I'm talking about diversity and inclusion and how I'm gonna relate this to lo-fi experience, the importance of diversity and inclusion to lo-fi experience. Let me just say what I think most of us already know, there's a variety of definitions of customer experience, and let's just say it's all the interactions a customer has with a business. Okay, great, everything that we do, and as we know, is the things that is from the customer's point of view, is what this experience is. So things that we heavily influence and even things that we don't heavily influence. But if the customer says it's a part of the experience, it's a part of the experience. So if you have a shop or a shopping mall or you have a location and there's a lot of traffic to get to that location, even though you don't control the traffic or are responsible for the traffic, if the customer assumes that's a part of the experience or if the customer says it's a part of the experience, it is a part of the experience. It might not be a part you can do much about uh, on one level, but it is a part of the experience. Oftentimes, when we think about this definition or you know, whatever definition you use, um, we tend to almost have go straight to it's that individual experience. Even though we know there's social media and there's other things, but we tend to think I'm having experience and what is my experience? That's the determination of this. Um, you know, it's all the interactions 
I have with the business. It's a, it's a very focused on this individual thing. And one of the interesting twists that I would like to, to add to this is that as we go through customer experience, it's actually much more of a social thing than we often put or, or we give credit for. So let me just start off with the basic concept. So already we have customer experience is this interaction uh, that a customer has with a business. A customer, this one says, right? Uh, and we know that that experience itself has um, you know, two parts, roughly speaking. There's this rational part. Yes, we do. You know, If I went to the store for eggs, did I get the eggs? If I went to the movies, could I see the movie or whatever else that goes on? And then there's this emotional part. The emotional part is unconscious for, for, in large measure, meaning it exists. It's working on us. It's in our heads. It's a major part of our experience, but we're not front of mind, consciously aware, paying attention to it. It's affecting us. And this gut feel of the experience is actually quite important. In fact, from behavioral economics, which I explained before, is really focused on how do people actually behave? And when you look at their actual behavior, it looks irrational. One of the reasons it looks irrational is because what's affecting decisioning is actually this emotional part of the experience. And so when we get to customer experience, we're actively trying to address the emotional experience, to get emotional engagement. But I think you all recognize if you went and talked to the customer, consumer, and you said rough, in rough terms, a consumer, customer, uh, would you like to have some deep emotional connection with my company? Generally, the answer is going to be no, because the rational answer is no. But we also know that companies that actually establish this kind of unconscious emotional connection with their customers do quite well and they get the real benefits of customer experience, which I'm gonna to talk to in just a moment. So the whole point here is customer experience is social. For an individual, each individual has these two components, this emotional and this, this, uh, this the rational and the emotional. The emotional is typically unseen. So if you remember the, the typical iceberg picture that you would see, there's a bit that's a bit, a bit above the water. And there's a big, big piece that's beneath the water. Well, the rational would be that bit that's above the water. We can see it. We can ask customers about it. Tell us what you want from us. Uh, you know, what price point is great? How do you, what do you think about the quality of our product? All those kinds of things. Why did you buy the product? Whatever they're saying, generally speaking, is going to be that rational piece. Then there's this big, gigantic piece that's underneath the water. The water is usually muddy, so you can't just see it. And it's impacting the way we do behaviors, so uh, the, or the behaviors or decisioning that we have. Okay, that emotional piece is informed by our values. And I'm gonna say how important that is as, as we get going. The key point here is emotional engagement is important. I think most of us probably know that emotional engagement is important. And I'm also saying that emotional engagement primarily is driven by an unconscious process. We are not literally asking companies to emotionally engage. Most of us will say that's not important. However, as I said, from research, we know that when that happens, business benefits and so on. So we want it as a business, we want it, but we can't just kind of say to the customer, here's something that we're offering you, emotional engagement. That's not what they're asking for. Okay, that takes us to why are we doing all of this? because we're looking for this sacrificial loyalty from the consumer. If we want sacrificial, so loyalty is the way most people would say it, we want loyalty from our customers. They come back to us, they spend more with us, they do it again and again and again and again. That's loyalty. I tend to call what we really want sacrificial loyalty. The sacrificial loyalty is the piece that says, we want our consumers to actually sacrifice to do business with us. What do I mean? We would like it if even though there's a slightly higher price point somewhere else, they stay with us. Even though they pass up three similar businesses to get to ours, 
they do so. Even though we're slow to market with a particular product, they wait for us to get it before they, they buy it and so on. So these little, sometimes major sacrifices are what we're looking for. And if you look at companies which are great in CX, typically they have co consumers who sacrifice willingly and happily. I don't mean they have a contract and are locked in. I mean, consumers willingly and happily sacrifice to do to interact with that business. That's a telltale sign that you have a great CX. Now, we're talking about Africa, and some of you might be saying, "Yeah, we have a number of people here who are super price sensitive, and all this is great." But you know, one 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 cent higher, and they're switching. What is clear is that if you are only wanting to compete on price, then really you don't have to listen to this presentation or real customer experience in the way most of us talk about it at all. If price is the only thing you're concerned with, then you know it's, it's Lean Six Sigma, it's BPR, it's, uh, it's other kinds of things that you can, you can go with to get, you, to get you there. Also, if your target, and that's another way of putting that is if your target audience, if your target audience is close to 100% price sensitive, then CX is probably not the first place you'd wanna to go to kind of work on things for your business. However, in Africa, I'm gonna guess most of you, uh, or if not, or many of you, if not most of you, are after this middle class, this burgeoning middle class that for 30 years has been growing at a top, top rate. The pandemic hit that middle class. Some of it has taken a, a, a huge hit. Um, but what's important, again, if we're looking for sacrificial loyalty, even with a middle class that might be a little bit struggling compared to where it was before, it means that when we get our bit of that middle class, we want them to sacrificially be loyal to us, which means we really want loyalty from that middle class. And I'm suggesting if this is what you're after, some version of your middle class, um, then what's crucial is emotional engagement, even though they don't consciously ask for it. And I'm saying important, a key component to that is diversity and inclusion for reasons I'm going to explain next. Now, we have indications that CX is social by one of the key metrics, popular global metrics, which is NPS, right? Would you recommend this brand, you know, this experience to others based on what you just happened? How likely would you recommend? So we understand that people are talking to each other. You know, you have that, you have um, those sorts of things. Um, and the importance of others is implied in, in a way in NPS you know, talking to others. Because we the assumption is not just you give us a nine or a 10. The assumption is that you actively are promoting this experience. You're going to say, you've got to try this, which means you're talking to others. That's the, NPS is the proxy, but we're actually looking at that behavior. So NPS has an implied communal proximity. It, Im it implies there's a community of people that you that you talk to. That community can be geographic, that community can be social as in social media or some interest or some values, what I would call values-based kind of thing. But within whatever, however you're defining community, there's this communal proximity. And we've increased the amount of, you know, or finding our tribe, our communal proximity through social media, but it can also be geographic. Okay, so NPS implies this social behavior. What's interesting is there's a concept called social learning theory. Uh, this is from other psychology. And it was really in a sense pioneered by this guy, the psychologist, Albert Bandura, which basically says, we literally learn by observing others. We learn by observing others. He was really talking about you know, regular school age and made the point that we don't ha actually have to do everything physically we literally can observe others and we learn strictly from that. The importance for that of us is in our experiences, in a social experience, so now it's not just me, it's me looking at you and other people, other customers of yours, I'm learning something just by observing those people. So it's not even just they're telling me, 
I can sit here and observe at the distance how you're responding, what you're saying, and I'm learning. And you know, this is all a part of the experience. So we said all interactions. So now I'm increasing the all interactions to be my observations of what you're doing with other people. I'm not even involved in that situation, but I'm seeing how you respond to that situation. I'm seeing how you deal with these types of people. And I'm also saying this becomes important because this is now feeding into that emotional engagement piece. This is the bit that's the gut feel. You, you, you're seeing it, it's being processed beneath the water level. So you're not necessarily consciously aware of it. And in some instances you are, but many instances we're just taking it on board. It's being processed and it's being fed into our, let's call it our emotional engagement meal. And it, out of that is part it's part of what's forming or helping us to form the gut feel of this feels right or it doesn't feel right for me, okay? So social learning theory, the whole point of that is there's a cognitive process. We actually learn by observing. I don't actually have to physically be in the experience. It doesn't have to be my experience. It can impact me and can impact me hugely. And in particular, it impacts that part of the experience or that component of CX that we already know to be the most important, the most impactful for decisioning, customer decisioning. Now, if we go into the neuroscience of it, and I won't spend too much time, some of you may have heard of mirror neurons, so mirror, mirror neurons. Basically, we have these two types of neurons. You know, there's, there's motor neurons, send signals through your body to move, to do things. That's the motor neuron. And we have sensory neurons that take information from the outside world, you know, think about your five senses and take it up to your brain. It's mixed in the brain and we, we then react. Well, this, this other kind of neuron is a mirror neuron. It has components of both of those. So in some sense, the idea is we've noticed or that some researchers have noticed that with this neuron, when we do something, when we are in the physical experience, these neurons are firing, right? So that's the kind of like the motor aspect of it. These neurons are firing. But they've also noticed that when we are observing others, these same, doing the same kind of, kind of thing. So if I, if I grab something, this neuron is firing, right? If I look at somebody else grab that same something, the same neuron is firing. And it's been hypothesized that this is one of the ways, this is kind of the, at least a theory, it's not proven just yet. And there's some controversy about it. But one of the thinkings is that this is, when we talk about empathy in our brains, this is kind of where it's maybe coming from, some hint that this plays some kind of role in what we call empathy, that I can literally observe, not participate, observe someone doing something you doing something, that business doing something with that person, someone doing something over there. And I can feel it in similar ways as if I were doing it. Almost the definition of empathy. So we have kind of a neural proxy for this concept of empathy. Tie that with social learning theory. I'm observing and I can learn. Tie that with a key component in CX is this emotional engagement. And we start to get to how important it is for us as a business to consider what it looks like to others in the group that we are dealing with. That becomes an important touch point, if you will, and how we're moving forward. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I did some work for a global tour operator, a, a huge one. You know, they have resorts, they have their air, they have their, their, their airplane and their flight crew and all that sort of stuff. They have all the stuff. So you can, you can book with them, you can fly with them, you can stay in their resort, you can fly back, the whole, the whole nine yards. So they had this thing and they had, I'm making it simple, but they had these two target audiences. Young couples, because they were going to take these vacations and if they could capture them, then they would be with them for the long haul. And families, because when they took vacations, they brought in four or five people and need the larger hotel rooms and need more flights, on the, I mean, more seats on the plane. So these were their big money making kind of target audiences. So they put a lot of emphasis. How do we market to them? How do we get to them? How do we do this to them? What's the young couple experience? What's the family experience as we go along? Do kids have this? Do kids have that? 
And then they had a secondary audience because these people actually do take holidays. They were retirees, so they have time now suddenly, and the elderly. So these were think about retirees kind of being, you know, recently retired, so maybe 60s, 70s, and then the elderly would be much older. Um, and these were the secondary audience for them. So they, they got money from them, but they were focused on young couples and families. And they had some issues with their CX and, you know, their, you know, not quite rating, but they couldn't figure out what it was because they asked them, when we did this, did you like it? The, the young couples and families said, yeah, we like this. We like what you're doing here. You treated us well. We liked all these things. We liked all these things, but they could never quite overcome this problem that they had. And we looked at some things. We, 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 we found, we tried to do some things. And one of the things we came upon is this. I'm just gonna give you an example. So in the airport for these charter flights, people would go and they'd wait online and be these long lines because the flight was at this time. And so people, all people come at the same time. And these retirees and elderly would be in the same line as the young couples and the families. And you know, there's a whole lot of excitement, but the energy level of course is different for the retirees and the elderly. But they, this company treated everyone the same, basically. Um, what, what we learned was, and what, we, what happened in the end was, um, they did some special things for people who were elderly, you know, clearly, you know, frail, physically frail, while standing in these lines. There were no seating, other kinds of things. So they gave them little portable seats and, you know, you can imagine things like this to make it a more comfortable for these elderly. And they did that in the airport. They did that. On the flight, they did that in the resort. They did, you know, all these little things for the retirees and elderly. Again, this is not their primary audience. What, of course, the elderly and the retirees liked these things. But what was most interesting is how it changed the perception of the entire experience for the young couples and the adults of the young couples and the families. They were looking at the retirees and the elderly and how the company cared for them and you know do all these things and it boosted like dramatically boosted the perception of care that this company had for young couples and families even though primarily nothing changed for the young couples and families so again i'm just using this as a kind of a proof point that says that what was literally happening is that they were looking at those people over there not connected with us the benefits they're getting is not necessarily connected to us directly, but it signals something to us. And that signaling is what's happening, turning in the uh, emotional or the unconscious part of, of the brain. And again, I'm just kind of relating that some mirror neuron activity going on. I'm looking at that. It's being connected and it's boosting my, because it's boosting what I'm thinking of my own experience because I'm living something over there. I'm, I'm actually getting to it. And what happened as a result of all this is that the young couples and families developed more sacrificial loyalty. They were willing at the end of this to pay slightly higher prices than they had before because of this mirroring activity. Now I bring this back to, to Africa to say that when we are thinking about what we are doing uh, and as practitioners, maybe you're using design thinking, maybe you're using you know, uh, you're doing your journey mapping, you're doing your jobs to be done, you're doing all of these things. We have to have diversity of perspective. We have to have this diversity and inclusion as we design, which means we need to bring in others if we are going after groups that are not just in our immediate sort of circle. You know, if you're working across countries or if you're working across cultures, then this is a crucial area for you. I think you probably already knew that, but I'm trying to emphasize the point of how important it is, not only in the design of coming up with things for the individual, but also in the diversity and inclusion of treatment in the experience. And this is an example, this global tour operator is an example. I mentioned earlier that part of this has to do with values. And I said, we were going through this and, you know, one of the things that influences this emotional engagement is that we're judging things. You know, I have some values. I'm looking at something over there and it's being connected. We also know that one of the global trends that's happening is the idea of uh, values-based consumerism. This is becoming increasingly important 
as urbanization occurs, which is a heavy uh, trend in Africa, as um, social media, of course, explodes, and of course, that's exploding everywhere um, and growing, and especially in urban regions in Africa. So what you have now are people being able to find, again, their quote unquote community based on things that are important to them. Uh, and the values might be different in one place to another, from one group to another, but we're able to find those communities. It's no longer just the traditional groupings, which might be ethnicity or language. There can be other kinds of groupings. We've seen this, or we are seeing this in China. So there's large parts of China that are not well off, and then there's a part of China that is well off. And a lot of these people, the burgeoning middle class in China, are moving to the to the to the metro areas, and so they're booming and that sort of thing at a, at a rate that's of course phenomenal, but we can kind of see what's happening there. And 84% of metropolitan Chinese support brands that commit to social justice causes, for example. And I don't have real data on where this is going in Africa, so I don't, I don't, I don't have that, but I do know as a global trend, the idea of values-based consumerism is important for informing emotional engagement. Values-based consumerism is important for informing emotional engagement. Um, so with that, that kind of takes us, I guess, a, in a, a sense of a circle. I've, I've tried to make a case. Diversity and inclusion uh, is important as a treatment, not just as a design piece. Um, it's key and is often an overlooked touch point for our target audiences. So you may have a target audience of this, but don't forget how that target audience is, uh, observes whoever is key for them. So if the elderly or how you treat the, the old, is an, it may not, they may not be your target audience, but don't forget the treatment of them is being observed and that may, if they are key for your target audience, that's uh, important. To get here, we have this concept of communal proximity. So this is be aware that mobile, social media, and urbanization are important trends or things that are happening in Africa. So it's making it possible for people to group and, and gather around areas that are important to them. And we can call that values-based consumerism. So it's growing. What are, you know, I, I just call these woke, if you have this term woke, woke consumers are here. And depending on where you are, it could be the environment. Maybe it's something else. It could be uh, whatever it is. Uh, but this concept of woke consumers, values-based consumers means they can find each other, which means now they can chat to each other, which means they can look and observe and what they see is out there. Um, the empathy is central to the human experience. We can explain that through mirror neurons to some degree, social learning theory. We literally can observe the external, what's happening over there, to other people like us or in situations that are important to us. And it impacts how we take on board things, especially the emotional side of CX or the gut feel. And that's impacted by the values that we have. Again, going back to values-based consumerism. So in terms of diversity and inclusion, there's really two points I really wanted to make. One, of course, have them on your design teams. And I think everyone kind of says that. But the diversity and inclusion I'm talking about is beyond just gender and demographics. It's getting at values and other kinds of things. In fact, one of the things I would suggest is if you kind of had a, a chart, think about three columns, function, skill, worldview. Under function, you might have your various departments in your business, marketing, you know, frontliners, digital, technology, legal. Under skills, you might have a variety of things. Uh, this could be a PowerPoint master, a data scientist, a storyteller, a public speaker, a visual artist, so on. You can list a number of those skills. And under worldview, these would be things like ways of looking at the world. So Gen Z, Gen X, millennial, a uh, person uh, with disabilities, a Westerner, um, Swahili speaker, whatever. So these could be different worldviews. And what you would, might want to do is just think about, based on whatever issue, topic, journey, experience you're working on, which would be important functions, skills, worldviews that might be important for this 
to build our diversity of perspective. Once you have that, look at the team that you have around you and tick off, tick, 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 tick. We have all those bits, oh, we don't have any women. Okay, that might be a good clue as to, you might wanna bring that on board. So just a, I mean, simple, easy exercise that I find most businesses don't do, but it's an easy one to bring on d &I onto the design team itself and having the appropriate diversity of perspective, not just gender or nationality or whatever, diversity of perspective is crucial. The second bit is the diversity and, and inclusion of persona and journey variants. This is kind of getting to that uh, uh, tour operator example. So you've designed your you know, a journey or key journeys, maybe you have some key personas, and now because you have diversity and inclusion on your design team, um, and of course you can always involve customers in this as well, but the idea is now that you have your basic journey, you can start looking at variants. So I always say, imagine a grocery store. You've designed the journey to go in and get you know, basics for the week. Uh, and you, you, have, you map out, you do this, you do that, here's what happens all these places. Then you can say, imagine if, is it important for us? It's a, it's a strategic question because it doesn't have to be important to you. Is it important for us that blind people, you know, have a certain experience? You can imagine going through the exact same journey you just talked about, but with that blind lens. And that gives you other opportunities to think about what could you do? So here in Dubai, I'm based in Dubai. Uh, we would like a lot of tourists from Russia. We would like a lot of tourists from, from, from China. They tend to have a lot of money. They're spending a lot of money right now. Um, many of those people come here. They don't speak either of the two main languages here. They don't speak English and they don't speak Arabic. So when we're, we have a basic journey that, you know, here's what it looks like when they do something with the, with the business. But we can start thinking, if I did not speak Arabic or English, what would this experience be? And I think, again, you can apply something similar in whatever experiences you're talking about. We have our main journey. We did all that work. We, we built that in. But are there key variants that we want to consider in this? This is not necessarily a whole new persona. It could be uh, if it was that important. But it might be variants which gives you opportunities to inject that. And if you hit those key touch points, again, the observation piece here, number one, the people who are the variants have a wonderful experience. And number two, if you've done this and you've connected your target audience to who they pay attention to, whatever it is they pay attention to, values-based consumerism, then you're able to address those points and, and take it on board. And this can lead to wonderful opportunities at cost saving, because you don't have to hit everything everywhere, but you're able to maximize the use of your, your wonderful experiences. So that was my really my take on diversity and inclusion, and hopefully, that gave you a little bit of a, a, a different flavor of how important diversity and inclusion is, especially in, in, in lo-fi experiences. Pooja? Thank you, Alpha. Alpha, we have one question for you that has come from the audience that I would like to ask you. It's, uh, it's, it says, where would the line be drawn between how specifically you target your customers and giving them all the same treatment. Yeah, so I think we already know, generally speaking, in customer experience, a basic principle is if you try to do everything for everyone, you do nothing for no one or you know for anyone. So the first part is when we say customer experience, to know that, that really means target audience experience. So I would say, what is your target audience? And I, I find that most businesses, honestly, a bit struggle with that their target audience because they really want everyone. And of course, we all want everyone. So the first bit is have a target audience. And you can have different target audiences, but have that target audience. Number two, design for a target audience. Allow everyone to, to buy. I mean, that's clear. Everyone can buy. But design for your target audiences. I think your question was, so, you know, you can start splitting things down and get to a million, you know, variations of these things. True, you could do that, but I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying a target audience is big enough. You've got your market, you know, you have whatever business case you've made for that. Number one, you I can identify some specific target audiences. Number two, once you've done that and you've kind of done the normal things that you probably do on the CX, and you kind of you have your basic personas and you have your basic journeys and you have your whatever it is, you know, you do on that side of things, 
So you have that. You, you understand what you want to do for that target audience. What I would say is if you understand the real values of that, that audience, and we're getting here now, just not what channels do you prefer? You know, do you, do you prefer to bust the contact on the weekends or not? Do you like, you know, chat bots or do you use mobile phone? Are you an Apple person or, or, you know, I'm talking the real values, what do they care about? If you kind of get closer to those values, and again, I'm just kind of making it simple, but if you found that, again, like the example that I had, young people actually do care about uh, the elderly as a concept, then what that allows you to do is go through your same journey and say, are there any variant points along the way that we can address? So I do not believe you should split this into a million different ways, but I do believe that you should have a target audience and that target audience primarily, if you can, should be closer to values rather than demographics, which is what you know. I think most of us probably towards try to. Hopefully, that answers the question. Thanks, Alpha. That was a great session about diversity and inclusion.